loves, welcome back. I'm going to be doing a really exciting video today and I feel like a few of you are excited about it as well, which makes my heart happy. Today we're going to talk about becoming a reader. This is going to be a multi-part series and I actually asked for some questions on Instagram as well, which gave me more ideas for more videos. So this first video is going to talk more generally about becoming a reader, particularly about finding good books because I think that's so key but we can get on to that in a minute. The next video is going to be more practical tips on how to read more and how to make reading a habit in your life. I'm also going to do a Q&A of some of your fantastic reading based questions that came up on Instagram so that will be in there somewhere and then I know that I mentioned in my recent Q&A about a note taking video um, or series even that I'm going to do because I also got a lot of questions about how to read more critically and I think through talking about note taking that's a nice entry point into how to read more critically and how to get more out of your books and how to maybe participate in discussions more fruitfully um, so that will all be covered in the note taking series um, that's going to be a kind of introductory video where I talk about why and how I take notes and then there'll be a whole series I'm hoping, a kind of regular-ish series where I take notes real time with you because I think you actually have to see it happen um, to get a feel for it. Uh, everyone takes notes different ways but we'll cover all of that in the note taking video. So those are the kind of three stages like kind of becoming a reader, practical tips for reading more and making reading a habit and then the note taking. I've got some notes for this video by the way so if you see me looking at this I'm just looking at my notes. There are so many good reasons to read books, particularly fiction actually, it's been proven guys, okay, science has proven me correct. It's good to read anything though, non-fiction, fiction, whatever, um, there are so many good reasons to read books and I think I might make another video um, called Why Read Fiction, but I assume you are here because you already know that and you already want to read more or get into reading as a hobby, as a habit. When I was thinking about this video, I came up with a few sort of stages, if you will. So stage one, people who have never really read that much or been into reading, have never really connected with it as an art form. Um, because let me tell you, reading and fiction, it brings me so much joy. I just feel like I need to say that quickly before we get into this video. The reason to do it is because it brings you joy. I think it's a really unique art form and there's something about it that if you find the right books it is just magical. I love my TV and I love my film and I love discovering good TV and good film. That also brings me a lot of joy but when you find a good book it feels so personal, you know? Yes, anyway, so there's stage one, people that have never quite experienced that, never found that, never got into reading never been a reader. Stage two, people that were big readers in childhood but fell out of the habit. You know, life is busy and just struggling to find the time to read and also struggling to find books that they enjoy as an adult. And then stage three, people that have actually gone and studied literature and just don't know what they're doing out of university basically just feel a bit lost in the world of literature now that they have no formal kind of education guiding their reading um, lost the habit of reading for pleasure uh, lost the feeling of pleasure that you get when you're reading because they've been forced to read various different texts at school maybe or maybe you've done humanities of some description and you read a lot or you read a lot in your degree so you're kind of familiar with complex reading but again you just haven't found your way back into it after university something like that so those are my three stages of people that I think might come to this video okay editing me is coming in here but I think for stage three I would also put people who consider themselves more casual readers maybe fall in and out of love with reading sometimes you read a lot and then you kind of lose it for a few months and you want to become a more regular reader so you have familiarity with what's out there maybe a little bit more of an idea of what you like I do think probably the next video is slightly more applicable to you but 
I think you fall under my stage three umbrella. And I was stage three. Um, let's put that out there first of all. I finished my master's degree and I hadn't really read consistently for pleasure for a long, long, long time. Um, maybe I would read a few books over the summer, but during my term time I would never have really read for pleasure. And I think that's really normal, by the way, um, that, you know, it's okay not to be able to manage that because to be reading all day reading really complex stuff and then go home and read as well sometimes it's just not feasible i will say that actually during my masters i did read a little bit more but we can talk about that later i was stage three and so i sort of found my way from there finally before we get into the rest of the video um someone asked me a really good question actually on instagram which was what does being a reader mean to you um i think she suggested like is it being able to analyse books, like the quantity of books you read, being a slow versus a fast reader? Honestly, none of those things. To me, being a reader means reading fairly regularly, doesn't have to be every single day, but you know, weekly probably, and enjoying those books. You probably don't even need to read weekly. If you read books and you enjoy what you read and you look forward to reading. That is what being a reader means to me and the, my definition that I'm using in these videos. I just want people to be able to read and enjoy it and it really doesn't matter what you're reading, I mean within reason, um, but like genre-wise it doesn't matter, form-wise it doesn't matter, um, if you want to read graphic novels, that is reading. Everything is reading um, and I just want to bring the joy, the sheer joy of reading to more people. If you want, if you're looking to read more, that is what I would love this video to help you do. So a lot of these things are going to be applicable across all three stages, but I'm kind of going to start with the stage one people and we'll move through and probably end up talking more about the stage three people in this video. Hopefully YouTube will split us up into nice chapters here. <laughs> I'll see what we can do if you want to skip to a particular part of the video. But I think one of the first things to do when we're looking at kind of stage one is to identify why you aren't a reader yet. Is it bad English teaching? Were you forced to read classics at school which just completely put you off reading entirely? Or did your parents make you read a selection of books that you never connected with? You know, were you not allowed to pursue genres that you liked um, for fear of feeling embarrassed or like people would judge you? Or is it something more of kind of a processing problem like ADHD or dyslexia? Um, I'm sure there must be really good book creators out there. Um, that probably talk about the ways they work with their ADHD to read more. But can I just say, obviously not having um, a great deal of first person experience, but I just want to throw audiobooks out there early on here. Don't let anyone ever make you feel that listening to an audiobook is not reading. I mean, obviously it's not physically reading, but it is still consuming books. What I want more than anything else is for people to consume more books, you know, because there's so many good books out there. And let me tell you, if you have ever, you know when people say, I don't really like films. Sometimes I see people say that and I'm like, what do you mean? But I guess their brains just work completely differently from mine. But if you've ever read a good article, a good short story, you've read one book that you really loved, any of these things, if you've ever read anything and enjoyed it to some extent, you know, you know that your brain can process joy through reading or you've listened to a story. Stories being key as well because, you know, fiction is stories. If you like TV and film, you know, you like watching stories unfold. There is, there are books out there for you, not just one book. There are many good books out there for you. It's just, and this is where we come to the key part of this video really, finding those books. That is, I think, one of the hardest things to do, especially when you're not already a reader and you're not kind of immersed in the book world. Finding books that work for you is going to be the biggest hurdle to becoming a reader. The only problem is, is that audiobooks are an art form in themselves as well, on top of like the book having to be good. Um, 
some people are more or less bothered by narrators. I find myself on the very bothered end. My narrator does have to be pretty good. But yeah, finding books, good audiobooks is actually a different thing in itself sometimes. If you find one that works, you find a whole series that works for you, audiobooks are a wonderful, wonderful thing and open up reading to so many more people. Another thing I think about maybe people that, I think this applies to all three stages to be honest, but um, probably feels most like a hurdle to our stage one people is often people have this stack of books at home which is just crap <laughs> or doesn't suit them. So books you've been given as gifts, books maybe you've picked up in a bookshop here and there, um, maybe they were new releases at the time three years ago and then you just never quite got round to reading them this you know this stack of books that people have and they think they have to start there when it comes to reading i'm here to tell you that at least initially ignore that pile completely the most important thing to do when i think you're trying to get into reading is to find books that you cannot put down that's like number one and the chances that you have on your bedside table the 10 best books for you are extremely slim <laughs> you know you can always return to that pile maybe there are some good books in there but you're just not quite ready for them yet first we need to find the good books then we can return to that stack maybe later on there are literally so many good books out there and books out there which is both good for our purposes because there's going to be something for everyone but bad for our purposes too because as i say it's really really hard to identify which ones work for you so my next tip is to join the library i know it's admin okay it took me years to do it it took me years to do it it took me about six minutes to sign up you know like very minimal time and they all have these like ebook libraries um, these days as well and lots and lots of resources even if the literal library itself doesn't have um, much in it which happens to be the case in my local libraries they'll call stuff in from other libraries they'll probably have an audiobook library that you can just access through your phone so you can try free audiobooks it means you can try stuff out for free you know so when you're trying to work out what your tastes are what you like what books work for you um, being able to sample books like that is invaluable um, and you don't have to go out and spend a lot of money doing it. So, as I say, that's our big hurdle, is to find stuff you like. Finding what your tastes are, finding what you like. You want to find, initially at least, the books you cannot put down. The books that are page turners for you. You're just desperate to get back to it. Um, they are out there. If you've never experienced that with a book, I promise you, there is a book out there that will do that for you. A few tips for this as well. Read a book that inspired your favourite TV show or film. You'll be absolutely amazed at how literally almost everything <laughs> started out as a book. Um, I can think of a... F I mean, that's an exaggeration, but Jurassic Park is a book, okay? That might be a really good place to start. Also, it gives you a nice familiarity with the world so that you have just an easier starting point, if you know what I mean. But also looking at your other kind of... Um, interests and hobbies and what you like in TV and film is useful too in terms of genre. So like what kind of genres do you like? Do you like, is there a particular period of history that you usually find yourself very interested in when you watch stuff about it? Um, do you like, you know, true crime? Do you like sci-fi films? You know, there's so many different ways to use your existing knowledge about what you like and put it to use with books and then you can just hop onto google search best fiction about world war ii best sci-fi novels best contemporary romance novels you know so many options there that might give you a nice little starting point for our stage tours you want to think about what you loved reading as a kid maybe even rereading something from that period of time just to Get the flavour of what you liked about it. Um, never feel afraid to reread something just because you think you should read something new. Rereading, I'm all about it these days. 
and I think it can be really helpful when it comes to trying to work out your own tastes as well. As a kid, did you enjoy speculative fiction? So a little bit about my kind of reading journey, I suppose, is that I read a lot of speculative fiction as a kid. A lot of kids do because a lot of children's literature and young adult literature, even <laughs> back in the day, was speculative to some degree. And then I did, you know, long periods of um, schooling, university, reading classics, reading reading literary fiction, which I do love as well, and also informs a large, huge part of my reading. And then I came out of university, and at university I discovered N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth trilogy, and, as in, in my master's, I realised I'd probably been a bit snobbish about speculative fiction in my adulthood, and that actually um, it was... One, just as wonderful as it was when I was a kid. So when I say speculative fiction, it means sci-fi and fantasy, basically. Um, stuff that is speculative, not real. And I made a big return to those genres, and you only need to see how many literary authors are writing speculative stuff these days to realise how like fundamental it is to much of our cultural output. But anyway, yeah, think about what you liked as a kid. Try and find similar things. Um, don't be afraid to read a bit of young adult literature as well as you're trying to get back into the habit. Like I say, it's it's a really a battle of finding your page turners and making it a habit. Now, for my stage one folks, this is where I get a little bit useless because obviously I love reading. I have studied literature. I have been reading ever since I was very, very small. So my recommendations are probably not a good starting place for you. Um, I did go into my little hive mind though uh, with the book club and I asked them about what they would recommend for people that haven't read a lot before and want good page turners, want things that are really accessible. Came up with some truly wonderful ideas. Unfortunately, a lot of the books I kind of read earlier in my reading are hidden behind what you can see. There's like three layers of books. I may make another video on this at some point, going into a bit more depth, but this is what my patrons came up with. So we have Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. Um, I read and loved this one. It's set in Victorian London. It's got a bit of a twist. Um, Hannah suggested that one, Books on the Bedside, but she also suggested Noughts and Crosses, which is wonderful. Um, it's young adult fiction from my era, and I, read it and loved it as a book, probably, probably a child really, not even a teenager, but it is definitely sophisticated enough to be very enjoyable as an adult. Um, Arne suggested Andy Weir's The Martian, which is a lot of fun. Um, the film with Matt Damon is based on it. Very like fun, nerdy sci-fi. Alex suggested Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book, which is a great fast paced short book, dark and tense as Gaiman does so well. Um, and Rachel also said that Neil Gaiman was a good shout. I agree, Neil Gaiman is a really accessible author who just writes really engaging novels. Um, Stardust might be a nice place to start with Gaiman as well. Um, Rachel also suggested the Chaos Walking trilogy by Patrick Ness and Pillars of the Earth, which I saw in another of these sort of books for not yet readers. Um, it's a huge book, I think, but it's a, a, Rachel described it as a rollicking read, and that is a historical novel. Neapolitan Quartet came up, uh, which is about two friends in Naples. Lottie suggested The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which I also back, it's been a long time since I read this one, it is a little chunky, but it is an engaging page turner for sure by Steve Larson. Pran suggested Circe and the Song of Achilles. Those have been really popular, I know. Those are kind of based on Greek mythology. Martina suggested If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio, which I haven't read. Khaled Hosseini's books, um, which include Kite Runner and, oh, I can't remember the name, A Thousand Splendid Sons, both of which are lovely books, uh, which I've read. And yeah, again, just really engaging. Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, lots of us loved that last year about um, some friends in the video gaming industry. Pachinko by Min Jin Lee, uh, Gillian Flynn's books. She suggested a few others as well, which I will write down below. And Eleanor suggested Blindness by Jose Saramago. Um, 
a good option for something thriller-esque slash mysterious but still literary and full of big questions. Those are some really, really, really wonderful suggestions. Recommendation from me, um, if you are looking for something speculative, when I was doing my masters I actually did read quite a lot recreationally and I used to read in my lunch break and it was a lot of reading but <laughs> I read a, a lot of Octavia Butler. I want to say like seven or eight Octavia Butler books. Um, she is like accessible, clever, great. I am going to leave the list down below of the full selection because I think there might be some more coming through as we speak but I can make a dedicated video about that if you would like to see it and I'll go through my red books a little bit more closely. I'm also going to leave a list of creators down below who read different genres um, than me, maybe some more romance books if that's what you're interested in or a different kind of less literary approach to sci-fi and fantasy. So many wonderful creators out there. I think consuming book creator content is a wonderful place to begin as well and you'll sort of learn who has similar tastes to you and I feel like the love for reading is infectious as well. So next stage, let's just talk more generally about finding books. Also, the importance of the DNF. So in the book world, DNF means did not finish. It's somehow become a verb. So to DNF a book is to put it down basically, not finish it. Friends, I cannot tell you how vital it is that you put books down that you are not enjoying. I mean, for anyone, it's enough to put them in a reading slump. But if you are sort of new to reading, it will just put you off reading completely. No matter who's recommended it to you or whether you think you should be reading it or this, that and the other, please find it within yourself to put books down. It is so, so important. There is no reason to be slogging through books that you aren't enjoying. Your time is precious, you know, and reading books is up there with one of the more time-consuming hobbies. You know, it takes a while to get through a book and you just can't be reading stuff you're not enjoying. This is kind of where the library comes in because then at least you can just give it back to them and you haven't paid a penny to read it. I do find it much harder to DNF books that I already own, but trust me, it's so worth it. Make it a powerful thing. Make it a thing like, yeah, I've put that book down to make room for a book I'm going to love. That's what I, how I kind of see it now, rather than like, oh, I failed at reading that book, you know? Um, you, it is true that maybe you could return to a book that sort of intrigued you, but was just boring you a bit or not quite working for you um, in a few years time. I do think there's Kate, and I feel like you'll sense it, that you'll sense those books that just aren't going to work for you and those books that maybe you're just not quite ready for. Please, please, please put books down you don't like. Please. Um, I had a few questions like, oh, how to push through a book you're not enjoying. Don't. Trust me, don't do it. Find books you do enjoy because there's so many books out there and you won't have time to read them all anyway. You must DNF books. <laughs> I can't stress that enough, especially when you're, you're, you're newly coming to reading, you know. Um, for my stage twoers and my stage threeers, consider rereading, like I said. Um, like I said as well, you know, it's very much about the habit of picking up the book. You want to have a book that you're really keen to get back to you. You'll be amazed at what you find in a book you enjoyed when you reread it. Or even just it, it creates, like, it, it, it gives you something, you know, because suddenly you're parted into the person you were when you first read the book and the person you are now reading it for a second time. And it gives you um, a new critical eye, maybe, because if you're not enjoying it as much as you did the first time round, you might be able to identify why or how your tastes have changed or what is still working for you versus what isn't. You know, it, it sort of gives you an interesting perspective to reread a book. Um, so yeah, if you've got any favourite books and you just want to get back into the reading space, reread them. My next point that is also really, 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 really important is all about the backlist. So backlist is 
books that aren't, you know, brand new. You know, a publisher is probably not actively pushing these books. They are books that have been published in the past. It is all about the backlist. I think so many people trying to get into reading are reading the current bestsellers, things that are currently being talked about. You do not want to limit yourself like that. You need to be looking at, you know, the last few decades of books because the chances that there are good books for you in there are much, much, much higher um, than just what's been published this year or even in the last few months. And that's one thing I will say about book creators. Um, lots of them read backlist like I do. Some focus a little bit more on new releases. And I think the people that focus on new releases, thank you for your work because I hate reading a lot of new releases and somebody's got to do it and work out what are going to be the books that stand the test of time. But beware that some creators are just looking at new releases and it can be easy to get caught up in the hype um, and lose sight of some of the backlist titles. And so I know it's much harder to find backlist titles. That's why kind of those, say you've got a genre you like, that's why those like best of lists are quite helpful. So for my kind of stage two and three years, uh, you can try prizes. I'm a little bit wary of prizes. I generally very often <laughs> disagree with the choices that um, judges make on these very highbrow prizes. But so when I came out of my master's, came out of formal education for the first time in many, 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 many years, I bought the entirety of the man book a long list that year and read my way through it fairly slowly. Um, most of those books were not a success for me, but some of the prize winners sometimes are a success for me. So I read The Sellout not long after that one, The Booker. I read A Brief History of Seven Killings not long after that won The Booker and loved it. Maybe reading shortlists or winners of prizes if you're kind of more at the literary end of things and you want to familiarise yourself with the just what's out there. Who's currently publishing? Who are the big names? Who are people excited about? Um, prizes are a nice way to do that. Um, also following creators that follow the prizes so you can glean the, their actual recommendations is very, very helpful too. So some of the best, the man booker, or I think it's just called the booker these days. Um, so the booker that's literary fiction, the booker international, that's obviously translated fiction, Pulitzer. The Pulitzer is very helpful, but I have to say that this year, the two books that won I'm not so convinced by. Um, the Women's Prize, that's obviously a classic. That's a UK-based prize, I think. The National Book Awards, that's a US-based prize. The Orwell Prize is interesting. It's got like books with a more political bent, mixture of fiction and non-fiction. Um, if you're looking for genre fiction, each genre will have its own prizes, so it's worth looking them up. But the ones I'm familiar with as a speculative fiction lover are obviously the Hugo Award, sci-fi and fantasy. I think that's more kind of worldwide. And then the Nebula, which is more US based, I think. The Dylan Thomas Prize is a nice one. Um, again, I'll list those down below for you. But let's talk more ways of finding books. So lithub.com is a really nice place to go. They have a lot of features, you know, just writing extensively about books. But um, if you go onto their menu at the top, they have a section called Reading Lists and they often publish really good reading lists. Just the other day, I found an incredible selection of Lit Hub reading lists called, I think it's called A Century of Reading or something, and they like summarize the best books from each decade, along with a gloriously long, long list. So you get like a really good idea of what was popular in the 90s or whatever. I, I found it because I was looking for 90s backlist titles. I wanted to um, read more 90s fiction because I tend to find I get along with it well. So I found a lot of good, they do a lot of reviews and you know they cover a lot of new books as well of course <laughs> they've got to make some money but I found some really good backlist titles through them. I'm pretty sure Train Dreams is the one that always pops into my head when I think of Lit Hub and Bookmarks.Reviews that's their sister site it's kind of like Rotten Tomatoes for books so that one's particularly good for new releases if you are interested in just familiarizing yourself with the the current names. If you want to have your finger on the pulse, um, bookmarks.reviews is a great place to go. So they kind of collate all the reviews on 
various books and they'll sort of give it a rating based on that. Yeah, they do weekly best reviewed books of the week and then best reviews to read because obviously book reviews in themselves are quite interesting. So it's worth looking there on occasion. Obviously, you could also join a book club. You can join my book club if you so please, but also your local book club, like it's worth checking out your library, it's worth checking out your local indie bookshops. Um, you could start one with your friends, um, or maybe you like a particular genre. I'm sure there are kind of genre-based book clubs if you just have a little look online. Or you could even just read along with Oprah. I mean, I don't know, but <laughs> there's so many book clubs out there and it's a wonderful experience to, to discuss books with other people. I think it, um, you know, it helps exercise that part of your brain that thinks about books, um, thinks about what you're reading, and it can really deepen and enrich your reading experience. And it also gives you like deadlines to read stuff by. So thinking about deadlines, back to libraries, might be a good resource, is a good resource for finding good books. Talking to your librarian, saying, you know, I love, I love rom-coms, I love whimsical films, what books would you recommend to me? The nice thing about a library is that, again, it gives you little deadlines to read things by because you've got to return things, which I think is very helpful um, to just push you to pick up a book a little bit more. Equally, going into a bookshop and talking to a bookseller is wonderful. A lot of bookshops these days have wonderful kind of staff picks selections, which I tend to find really much more helpful than the sort of new release selections that they they have to set out. Um, I'm just talking to a bookseller as well and always read the first few lines, maybe even the first few pages um, of books where the blurb interests you because um, sometimes you might instantly be put off. There are also, I was having a little Google, there are also some websites and also like ChatGPT which if you feed it books that you like it will give you recommendations based on that. If you feel like human interaction is just way too much for you, <laughs> let the AI do it. As long as you go and buy from your local indie bookshop and go to the library and use it, I think we can allow a little bit of AI in this case. Finally, a bit of a rogue one. I don't actually listen to any myself because I'm not a big podcast girl, but listening to a book podcast, there's lots out there and a lot of them really focus on backlist titles. So that could also be a really nice thing and again, I will um, take the recommendation of my wonderful, wonderful book clubbers and I will put them down below in the description box as well. I think that brings us to the end of this video. Just in conclusion, it is a long process finding your taste in books, finding what works for you, finding what doesn't work for you. It can take a long time, it can be just an ongoing life process, I feel that way myself, still discovering things about my own reading all the time, and I wouldn't say honestly until the last year or so have I really felt that the majority of what I read suits me and works for me and I like it, and that is partially being able to DNF books. Like I said, so, so, so important to give up on books that you don't like. And also my book club. I mean, they're wonderful. It's just incredible to chat to other book lovers and get all of these amazing recommendations of books I never would have otherwise heard of. Buddy reading together, reading for book club together, truly, truly just the most wonderful experience. When reading is a, an established part of your life, you may want to kind of branch out from those genres that you like and styles that you like. And maybe you do want to push through slightly in a book that maybe didn't appeal to you too much six months ago. But when you're just trying to get into reading, finding those books that just work for you is really, really important. If you found that you've DNF 20 books in a row, it might be worth just pushing through the first 50 pages of, you know, the most successful of those. And generally 50 pages is a good indication of how if, you, if you're gonna like a book if you get to the 50 page mark and you're like eh you're probably not gonna like the rest i hope this has been somewhat helpful i hope it helps you find the books you like another final point actually never feel bad about what you like i think a lot of people get in their heads about what they should be reading if people are going to judge them for reading this that or the other please don't be worried about the kind of the covers of your books or the genres of your books or 
whether it's young adult or adult, there is no guilty pleasure here. There is only what you enjoy. And if you enjoy it, enjoy it to the full, enjoy it to the max, and don't feel afraid to look into those genres that maybe you had dismissed. Um, because you might find some of your favourite books there. It is reading that is the wonderful thing, you know. It is not reading specific books. So, yes, that concludes this video. As I said, um, the next video is going to be more practical tips for literally reading more and making it a habit in your life. I hope you enjoyed. Let me know if you do have any more questions and stuff down below and I will pop them in the Q&A. But yes, I hope this was helpful. <laughs> I'm worried that it wasn't but I hope it was and I hope it makes you feel good about your reading and excited about your reading um, but thank you so much for watching today and I will see you very soon bye